Welcome to Digging Deeper, a podcast of Perimeter Church in Atlanta, Georgia, hosted by me, Jeff Norris, along with my co-host, Laura Story Elvington. This podcast aims to equip you to follow Jesus by digging deeper into the teachings and the topics of the Bible and culture and life. In this season called Believe, we'll sit down with many exciting guests who will help us understand the current and future direction of belief in Jesus in our world today and how we as God's people can engage in God's mission to lead others to believe in Him. We're excited that you've joined us as we explore the treasures of God's Word and apply its teachings to our lives as followers of Christ. Now let's jump into today's discussion. Laura, we are excited to have Grace Atanto with us. Uh, and Grace, thank you for joining us uh, by Zoom here uh, from Washington, D.C., where you serve with RTS. Tell us more. I, I just mentioned that, but tell us who you are, what you do there at RTS, maybe a little bit to orient our listeners to, uh, to who you are and, and uh, what they can look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, I grew up in Jakarta and then Singapore and then back to Jakarta before I graduated high school. Became a Christian right at the very end of high school. Ended up at the States at Biola University for my undergraduate years. Went to seminary in Philadelphia at Westminster. And then after finishing up with my doctoral work at the University of Edinburgh, I went back to Jakarta to plant a church. Was a church planter there and also a pastor for about four years before joining RTS DC here as the assistant professor of systematic theology, where I've been. Um, since 2020 technically, but I've only moved here in 2022 because of COVID immigration delays mm, yeah. and the whole world was in turmoil, I guess. So that was yeah. the reason. Um, I'm married to Indira and I have a little daughter, two years old. She was actually born just a month after we arrived in DC. Um, and we've been, yeah, been here since then. That's awesome, man. Wow. I got to comment on a couple of those things. One is one of my very best friends, closest friends in the world, grew up together, went to college together, have done life together, uh, is currently uh, in Edinburgh s- serving as a missionary there in Scotland, uh, primarily at the University of Edinburgh. So, uh, wow. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, with, I... he's with Campus Outreach over there. Um, okay. Uh, doing college ministry. So um, I'll have to connect you guys at some point. Yeah, it'll be great. One of my really good friends is still a uh, pastor there at the um, St. Columbus Free Church right at the Royal Mile. I wonder if they're Yeah, the that's same. where he that's where he is. Yep. There they're we connected. go. They yep. must know each other. Yeah, they do. Corey Brock's a good No doubt. Yep. Absolutely. We've yep. talked about him and and uh, they've connected and really uh enjoy doing ministry together from what I hear. Uh, the other thing is I'm curious, what would you do your doctoral work in? I did my doctoral work on Herman Boving's epistemology, theory of knowing. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay, we've got Again. to connect. We've got to <laughs> connect Gray with Caleb Click. Yeah. yeah, so one of our pastors who served here for years and years, and just went on to to pastor his his own church. He was kind of associate pastor here. Um, at, just was a massive Bavink fan. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sad that he's not. And here he's for currently this. working on his doctorate, and and Bavink's a big part of that. So anyway, we'll have to connect you guys. That's great. So yeah, I wonder yeah. if I actually received an email from him one day, but um. Probably yeah, so. you probably you know, did. I never, never expected that there would be such a Bob Inc. wave right now uh, when we started our PhDs together. So I and Corey were both PhD students at the same time at Edinburgh, and that's how we got to know each other. And Bob Inc., I mean, it was just it was just the two of us back then. Yeah. But now suddenly everybody's now it's a huge him, thing. Yeah. Amazing. And if yeah, you're listening and you're like, who is this Herman dude that you're talking about? Just just Google Herman Bob Inc., B-A-V-I-N-C-K. And uh, there's all kinds of, he's kind of become the new, even though he died over a century ago, he's, uh, he's like kind the of new Taylor Swift of, theology. of, 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 of reformed theology. Of reformed That's theology. right. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of true, actually. <laughs> In our little circle of reformed faith, uh, Bob Inc. has become a huge deal. So, and it occurred to me that we said RTS, some of our listeners may not know what that stands for. It stands for Reformed Theological Seminary and lots of campuses and, and you serve at the one in Washington, D.C., which is awesome. Um, all right, great. Let's jump in, man. Let's, um, let's talk about this, this theme that we are hitting a lot on in our, in our teaching series through the book of John. Um, it, it, the theme that is so very prevalent throughout the whole book is belief. You know, John even says, I write these things so that you may believe, right? And, um, and it shows up over and over and over again. It's the thesis of, of this gospel. Uh, so let's start just very fundamentally this would be helpful for any listener to either be reminded, oh, yeah, this is what we're talking about when we talk about belief, or maybe for the first time hear something go, oh, 
I don't think I've heard it that way before. So when we talk about belief in the Christian faith yeah. uh, and believing unto salvation, yeah. what are we talking about? What, what are some things that come to mind for you? So many things come to mind for me. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for that. It's a great question. It's a very foundational sort of question. I think when people think about the idea of belief, um, especially in the post-Christian Western world, secular world that we live in here today, we think about belief as a very subjective opinion as contrasted to therefore knowledge, right? So people say, we don't know that that's just your belief. What they're saying by that is they're saying you have a subjective sort of idea, but it has no grounding in reality. And so therefore it's just an opinion that you have to distinguish from public knowledge. So it's just a private thing, or is this an objective thing? But that's not really what we see in the Bible. When we talk about belief and faith in the Bible, you know, you connect the belief with the Christian faith. We have to tether that belief to some, 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 something objective, something outside of you, something that is real, even though it's invisible. So one of the things I say to my students is you see belief when you talk about the good and the true and the beautiful, right? So everybody believes in the good life. Everybody believes in the goodness of pursuing meaning and purpose in your life. But what is purpose? What is meaning? What is exactly the good that you're, you're looking for? Oftentimes that goodness isn't defined by something empirical or something physical, right? So you talk about, um, believing in values like compassion, believing in values like forgiveness, believing in values like, um, well-being and things like that. Um, none of these things are actually empirically defined or tangible yet at the same time we pursue them. And so we believe them in, in the sense that there's something objective you're pursuing and yet they're invisible. And so in the Christian faith, belief has to do with that external reality, the good, namely God. And you're also recognizing some truths about where you are in relation to that good. Um, you believe that you've fallen short of that good. You're a sinner deserving of his displeasure as your membership vows would probably say, right? And then you also believe that this goodness came in um, human form, in human nature. Uh, the Logos himself became flesh, John 1, 14 says. And so therefore you believe that there's now a way to get reconciled with this goodness, namely via the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. So belief has to do with this objective reality. It has to do with this thing that you're pursuing and yet it's not empirically tangible. And belief has to do with owning it, saying that this is true, not just outside of you, but also true for you. Um, you're grasping into it, right? So when you say that you, you believe in your wife's commitment to your, toward yourself, you believe that this, this benefits you and there's this external reality, um, that, that has to do with you and that's been done for you. So we can talk all about that in terms of the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith, the creeds that you believe in credo just means I believe in something, right? So we talk about the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, so there's objective content of the Christian faith. But as Luther said, this is now your faith, um, my faith. Um, this is something that you're grasping onto as well. So maybe we can start with those particular ideas. Yeah, that's good. And when we think about the person of Jesus in particular and the, uh, the objective truth about him, what are some of those things that we believe? What are, what are the things that we would say, okay, if he is the object of our faith in, this, yeah. in the sense of, uh, you know, everything really for the Christian faith hinges or it hinges on him. It either falls or arises or is built upon him. Um, what do we believe about Jesus? Who is he? Yeah. Um, so much of what we believe in the Christian faith is stated in things like the Nicene Creed or biblically speaking, you know, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, Paul talks about things that are of first importance, right? In 1 Corinthians 15. And what we believe about Jesus is that he is God of very God, right? He is the second person of the Trinity who, though he was equal with God and has a divine nature, eternally speaking, didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, Philippians 2 tells us, but rather humbled himself, taken on the form of a human uh, servant and became obedient in our place. So one of the things that, that's significant about that claim is that human beings are not able to be obedient. We've become sinful ever since the fall of Adam, right? We're all corrupted by sin. And therefore we've fallen short of the glory of God. And because we are not able to become righteous ourselves, God himself took on human nature so that he would become righteous on our behalf. And he was good for me. He lived the life that I should have lived, died the death that I should have died. And so when he died on the cross, the wrath of God that was accrued to me was now put on Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of God that I couldn't have for myself was actually accomplished by Jesus Christ. So he was our substitute. 
And God raised him up from the dead to vindicate that righteousness because no one who is righteous can stay dead, right? Um, and when he was resurrected, therefore, we have assurance of faith that his righteousness was fully accepted by God. And we lay faith on him. We direct our attention to him because we say, that is my representative. That is my um, covenant head, right? And so his righteousness becomes my righteousness when I say that I'm now pledging my allegiance to him, when I am now faithful towards him. Um, he represents me. Just as a king of a nation represents his nation or a president represents the country, so did Jesus Christ represent his church. And so by membership within his church through faith, um, we can have that assurance of salvation as well. And he's ascended to the right hand of God. And by looking to him now in heaven, we can be assured of our destiny as well. Because if he's there, then it means I could be there. That's great. So all of these things, these amazing truths we see in the New Testament, what did it look like in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. What did belief look like? Because I know for, for Jeff, I would guess that you as the lead teacher here, I hear the question I often hear just as, as I teach the Bible different places where they say, now, now in the Old Testament, they gain salvation by the law, right? Yeah. In the New Testament, it's yeah. by grace. How would you answer that question? Yeah, that's a, a huge biblical theological question. I think the first thing we got to say is, you know, if salvation is by the law, then there would be no hope. Yeah. Um, not just for us, but also for our Old Testament saints. So if we read Genesis 3 carefully, right, what happened is after the fall of Adam and Eve, after that first sin, um, death and destruction came into creation and sinfulness came into creation. You can read Genesis 3 in the letter of Romans 5. Through the sin of one man, death and sin came to the world. Romans 5 elaborates for us. And so um, Adam and Eve deserved to die. And in fact, they did spiritually die afterwards. And all of humanity died with him. We we're all corrupted in the flesh because of what they did. And there is technically speaking now no hope of salvation. And the thing about Genesis 3 is, is two things happen. First, instead of dying immediately, physically speaking, God covered up Adam and Eve by way of animal skin, which is a kind of foreshadowing of the fact that we needed a substitute. Somebody else or something else had to die in our place. And so they were covered up. Their sin, their nakedness and shame was covered up by that animal skin. Second thing that happened is in Genesis 3.15, God promised Adam and Eve a seed, a seed that would crush the serpent and a seed who would, who, whose heel would be struck by the serpent and at the same time would, would crush the serpent's head. And so what the Old Testament uh, storyline is telling us to do at that point is to look for that seed. Who is this person who would be the substitute who would die in their place, right? And the, the animal skin and the sacrifices of the Old Testament foreshadowed that great once and for all sacrifice. And also at the same time, who is the seed who's going to come? And uh, as we see in Jesus, the seed and the sacrifice are really one, one person, right? Um, so... All the way throughout the Old Testament storyline, we're, we're seeing this, this question of who would be the seed? Would it be Abraham? And who would it be after Abraham? Because Abraham has promised a seed as well. Would it be Jacob? Would it be Esau? Would it be um, Ishmael? Right? All of these questions are really focused on this seed, this descendant, who would be that promised one. And all the way throughout the Old Testament, we're reminded again and again that these people like David, Solomon, they are not the seed because they're sinful. They too need sacrificial atonements. They too require some other seed who would represent them, would be greater than them, would be better than, than Moses, better than David, better than Job, and all these Old Testament figures. So the Old Testament saints were saved by looking to the promised one, by having faith that one day God will send us this seed, this Davidic seed, this Mosaic seed, was greater than Moses, David. Um, and ultimately, that is found in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. In the new covenant so old testament saints look forward to jesus they have faith in the coming seed even though they do not know exactly how that seed would be brought about how that seed would come um but the new testament saints it's like us after this side of the new covenant we look back to jesus christ his once and for all sacrifice that's so good yeah mm -hmm. i've heard it heard it said before kind of maybe encapsulated as saying you know old testament believers uh were saved by by faith in the one who would come we are saved by faith in the one who has come Right. And it's the yeah. same person. It's all, you know, it's, it's Jesus. You know, sometimes I, uh, I like to ask the question, you know, thinking about Genesis 3 and all the significant, I mean, massive amount of implication that happens in that chapter of the Bible and really in the first three chapters of the Bible. But um, 
sometimes I like to ask the question to people, hey, when, when was the first occurrence of bloodshed in the Bible? And, and if, they're, if they know their Bibles to some extent, or even if they don't, they might, most people immediately say, when Cain killed Abel. Mm-hmm. And to be able to draw their attention to, well, actually, no, the first occurrence of bloodshed in the Bible was initiated by God himself to cover his people. Uh, when he with the animal skins, and how that was a foreshadowing of like that the salvation only comes through through bloodshed, and it was a picture of the bloodshed that would come that would that God would initiate again to cover His people in a much more significant way with His righteousness, not just with the skin of an animal, but with the righteousness of His Son. So uh, it's it's uh, it's really profound to dig into all that's happening there in the beginning stages that's recorded for us in in Genesis and the implications of of salvation. Um, it, here's a question for you that um, that we're curious about, even as we were talking before we started recording with you, is what are you seeing as a seminary professor, and you're, you're mostly uh, dealing with uh, people coming through seminary at a young, youngish age, right, in their, yeah. in their 20s, uh, maybe fresh out of college. I know we have many that come through seminary that are older than that, but, but most yeah. would be younger. Um, how are, how is the younger generation wrestling with issues of belief right now? And even those who, yeah. you, certainly they would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm man, I'm at seminary. Right. But what are some things that you're observing that for, you know, I'm 44, Laura's like 20 something, I think, um, but yeah, 27. Right. Um, what, uh, how are you wrestling <laughs> in, in your 20s? How are you wrestling <laughs> with 20s. belief? <laughs> uh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, but our age, you know, what would be surprising to us that maybe some things that you're observing about belief with the younger generation? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I think one sentence to summarize that up is the movement from objections about the truth of the Christian faith to objections against the morality of the Christian faith. Hmm. Oh, that's good. Right? Yeah. Um, so I think in the past, especially 12 years ago, when we were talking about the new atheism, uh, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris and so on, they're really asking questions about the truth of the Christian faith, that yeah. it's not reasonable to believe in the Christian faith, that in fact, the resurrection didn't happen. Miracles didn't happen. So what did apologetics look like 12 years ago? A lot of it was focused on evidentialist apologetics, right? Producing evidences of the resurrection of evidences, historiographical evidence, archeological evidences to the effect that this or that miracle might have happened or is, is the best explanation for some historical evidence that we have. But I think today, most of the time, you know, when students come into class and they're taking my apologetics classes, the questions they're asking is, how do I show to people that the Christian faith is beautiful, that the Christian faith tells us a better story, makes better sense of their lives, and isn't actually going to lead us towards a kind of intolerant um, culture of bigotry, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, a kind of judgmental culture. So I think a lot of um, unbelievers today, they, they're, they're objecting Christ- to Christianity, not so much because they think that Christianity is untrue, but but because they think Christianity creates a kind of social culture that I don't want to be a part of. Um, that's not the kind of group that I want to be associated with, namely judgmental, intolerant, hypocritical um, people, right? So I think so much of our, what we need to do as a church is to reflect on our witness, um, the ethos with which we, we provide that witness, and also really focus our attentions on the fact that Christianity does actually provide a beautiful, not only coherence, but also a beautiful, morally compelling vision of human flourishing. I heard it said, and I can't remember, you may, as I say this, you, Gray, you might know who this came from, but I heard it. Uh, said recently in the last few years, uh, someone broke it down as roughly speaking, and there's always exceptions to this. Whenever we start talking about generations and you know, gener- you know, uh, boomers versus Gen X, so on and so forth, there's always yeah. exceptions. It's not clean cut, but generally speaking, the the question that uh, those in the boomer generation and, and to some extent maybe Gen X were asking was, um, what is true? That was the fundamental mm-hmm. question. Then as you progress into Gen X and millennial, millennials, uh, the fundamental question became more what is good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and maybe to some extent what is right, but what is good and right. But the question that's being asked by the younger generation now, Gen Z and, and younger, to your point, is what is beautiful. And right. um, 
I, have you heard that? I don't remember who I heard that from. And, and it sounds like you agree with that. Is that kind of in general the way you would frame it yeah. as well? Definitely. You know, I've learned a lot from um, fellow Keller Center cultural apologetics fellows like Joshua Chitra and um, Christopher Watkin, for instance. They talked about that quite a bit during our conversations and in their books as well. Um, they talk about the turn towards the imaginative, right? Um, that there's a kind of social imagination against Christianity because Christianity doesn't create a culture that they want to be in. And it actually provides us quite the opportunity apologetically because I think Christianity has so many resources to communicate that there is, again, flourishing available that we're, that we're offering. In fact, one of the ways we communicate that to this younger generation is to say you know, so many of the objections that you have against Christian faith, the social and imaginative and moral objections that you have actually live on borrowed capital because so much of what we take for granted now in terms of how we're thinking about what the beautiful life is, is dependent on our past Christian historical intuitions. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Chris Watkin, um, we had a, um, this event for, for the Keller Center um, for Cultural Apologetics one night, and he talked about how when Christians are being beat up by non-Christians with their sticks, we're oftentimes looking up at that stick and we're saying, that's my stick. <laughs> um, you're saying, you know, Christians oftentimes resort to intolerance. Well, where do we get the idea of toleration from? Patience with others, to be forgiving with others, to prioritize that over judgment. To go there. zoom out mile, and take a look. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, if you zoom out and, and take a look at world history in the Greco Roman world, resorting to violence, intoleration, judgment, that's actually something valuable for them that they want to go there. Um, and now at the same time, we're, we're saying, you know, it's bad for you to be judgmental. It's bad for you to, to be intolerant. Well, that's because of the, you know, Glenn Scrivener calls it the, the compassion revolution. And now Christians suddenly came around and said, the way forward as, as a flourishing society is not by taking judgment for yourself, but rather to forgive others as Jesus Christ has forgiven you and to consider others better than yourself, to consider yourselves lower than others, right? Because the first shall become last and so on. So something happened in world history where so many of the values that the Greco-Roman world took for granted was overturned by the Christian faith, which produced um, the values that we believe in here today. And now how the West is characterized is that the West is actually described by many as a post-Christian society. And it's post-Christian because we have this Christian past and that Christian past has produced the cultural intuitions that we have, which are oftentimes invisible to us because it's so common. We, we, we presume that the things that we take for granted in the Western world are just common sense, natural intuitions when they weren't. They were very much in, um, the results of the formation of our Christian history. Um, and now, basically, what the post-Christian West is telling Christians is that we're falling short of our own values. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the apologetic opportunity is to say, hey, Christian, live up according to your values. And secondly, where did you think those values you're beating us up with came from? Well, namely our Christian past. And so people are revisiting the Bible because of that, I think, in interesting ways. Yeah, in its, in its origin, the, uh, the whole Western framework in its origin was shaped by, by the Christian worldview and the way in which we... And, and it's reminding me, and Laura, I'm sorry I'm talking so much because no, I know you're fine. sitting on some questions over there, but a quick comment before, before you jump in. It's reminding me of that. I don't know if you've noticed um, the ad campaign that is popping up. Um, I think they, gosh, they ran two or three of them uh, uh, in the Super Bowl when that happened. And, and it, but it's happening in, in general just consistently of the Jesus Gets Us campaign. And regardless yeah. of what you think about, are those effective or not? And what's it really being, you know, what's trying to be conveyed? I mean, they're, they're my understanding is they're meant to be evangelistic and to help people to see that who Jesus is, which is awesome. But I think part of the, maybe the secondary message of it is uh, to remind people kind of what you're talking about here is like, hey, all these concepts of compassion and washing the feet of others and moving towards those who are marginalized and caring for the needy and the forgotten and like, that, yep. that's a Jesus thing, right? That's not a new thing. That's not something that we're just coming up with now in this compassion movement. Like this is, this is rooted in the person of Christ and his teachings and his way of life. Um, and so, and it's, it's a reminder to Christians to remember that, uh, but also to a, a Western world that doesn't know, hasn't realized, or has forgotten that that's actually where it all is rooted to begin with. So kind of interesting right. to think about. Yeah. So. Well, as, as we begin to, to wrap here, um, 
I wanted to I wanted to get your thoughts on something. I had an experience probably may have been eight or ten years ago, and I was leading worship for a training of college ministers, and it was a uh, a very large denomination that all of us would be familiar with, and actually the president of the denomination was the one doing the training, which was a neat opportunity for them. But what ended up happening, um, he basically was sharing with these three, four hundred college ministers um, a new idea of belief. And what he was, he was talking about how um, we need to shift from this restrictive idea that we have to believe in the name of Jesus in order to gain salvation. And he was Mm. saying it really, um, we can believe that, that salvation comes through Jesus without actually being able this side of heaven to attribute that to Jesus. So when he was asked, so basically how do you gain salvation? His answer was, it really is more about the sincerity of your belief. So here's my question for you. Why is that a slippery slope at best and a dead end um, ultimately? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think two responses to that. First, you know, it sounds more open-minded, but it's actually very close-minded because, you know, people say to me, Christians are always drawing lines, right, uh, between those who believe in Jesus and those who don't believe in Jesus. Let's not draw lines at all, right? And my response to that is to say, well, everybody's drawing lines. In fact, you just drew the line. You just drew the line between those who don't draw lines and those who do draw lines. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're self-refuting, right? Um, and so that's, that's not going to work, logically speaking. But secondly, as well, you know, sincerity, it's, it's a slippery slope because that's a new form of salvation by works, I would say. It's a salvation by a new law. How are you ever sure about how sincere you are? If that's the source and the ground of your salvation, then I think it's always going to put a lot of people under a lot of jeopardy. Um, and, you know, because you, you're, you're never going to be sure about how sincere your faith is. Um, and one of the, th- the comforting things about the Christian faith, about the biblical message is that it's not the sincerity or the strength of your faith that saves, but it's Christ who saves. And you just have a weak, open, empty hand receiving that faith. Um, maybe I'll say a third thing. The third thing I'd say is that actually shows a more sort of parochial, Western-minded, post-Christian, secular, enlightenment mentality that sincerity is the criterion. You know, I think in the West, people take for granted that psychological authenticity is the best way to live. And again, it's become a new law. But the question is, why, why think that's the case? Why think that's the highest priority? You know, you're, why think that faith in psychological authenticity is that which grounds, you know, human meaningfulness or human happiness or psychological well-being. Why think that? Um, many cultures around the world don't think that way. Um, so I think what, what might be obvious to, seemingly obvious to perhaps our non-believing listeners isn't actually obvious across the world. So the three objections there, perhaps. That's good. That's so good. Say more, but yeah. That's yeah, really no, great. it's really great. Um, quickly here. Yeah. What would you say, and you spoke to it just a moment ago, and, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this, but I'd love to hear a little bit more on what you're seeing, and even as one who uh, was spent a lot of time in your childhood and adolescence in a different part of the world, Yeah. what do you see, you know, how might American faith, Western faith look different from what you have seen in other parts of the world, you know, kind of globally, what are Christians believing versus how we tend to let our beliefs be shaped here? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. It's a great question. Um, I think, again, so much of the objections coming from the Western world against the Christian faith is this idea that Christianity is oppressive against my psychological authenticity. Like, if I can't follow what my, my feelings, my deepest needs, my deepest desires, psychologically speaking, internally speaking, then I'm not authentic as a person. And Christianity suppresses that, so therefore Christianity must be false or, or bad or something like that. Um, and again, that's not, and that actually plays itself out, especially in our gender debates and our sexuality debates, sexual ethics, right? If, if these are my sexual desires and feelings, then who are you to oppress my sexual desires and feelings? I need to express myself psychologically, authentically, sexually, and so on. That's really not the way in which most of the objections against Christianity sounded like in the Eastern world or Asia specifically. I mean, my ministry was primarily in Indonesia, so I'll speak specifically to Southeast Asian Christianity and 
the sorts of objections that I faced there as a pastor, that's um, the Christian sexual ethic in Asia is considered natural law. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. men and women belong together. The family is a good thing. In fact, Confucianists really like Christianity because we believe in, you know, honor your father and mother, which has a point of contact with the Confucianists' idea of filial piety, that the, the sons and daughters must be loyal to the head of the household and things like that. Um, so that's not controversial. In fact, they love that. Whereas that's the most controversial thing in, in Western context, yeah. right? Mm, Sexual ethics, family, and things like that. And I think that's just helpful to know. If you zoom out, it sounds like the Western objections are ubiquitous and just natural and just intuitive. They're not. They're actually really contextualized, specific objections that are not shared by the rest of the world. Um, and when you take a look at, again, Asian context, Southeast Asian context, where, which I'm most familiar with, the objections against the Christian faith primarily are objections to passages like Luke 14, where Jesus says, unless you, you hate father and mother and follow me, then you're not a true disciple, right? Um, you, you can almost never preach about passages like that because that's really offensive to the hierarchical and familial values of our cultures and systems. Um, so, so much of our pastoral work is, you know, talking to parents, children who are wrestling with these faith commitments that they have now, but the rest of the family aren't, aren't sharing that faith commitment. And so what do we do with hospitality? What do we do with our loyalties? Because if you depart from your religion in an Asian context, you're departing not just from that personal religion, but you're departing from your, your family. You're saying, you know, so when people convert from the Islamic faith, when they convert from Confucianism, um, their surrounding familial um, relations, what they're saying to them is they're saying things like, don't you care about your mom? Don't you care about your children? And I think in, in a Western context, we're like, well, what does my faith have to do with my parents or my children? Yeah. Yeah. My personal Total disconnect. Yeah. Wow. Right. Whereas there it's like, that's supposed to be the first thing that comes to your mind when you believe your brought up faith is that you're actually disloyal to your family. So it's a completely uh, opposite sort of idea of faith, I think. There. And yeah. with that comes a lot of shame, right? The, Absolutely. In, in that yeah. culture and, and which also speaks to something we won't get into today, but just the, the Western priority of individualism and, right. and how that's such a huge part of our fabric here that we don't even often realize is how we operate. Um, yeah. Family's that's important. Why... Family's important to us, but it's, it's just, it's not, it's not, um, it's not the same is, is our brothers and sisters in, in Asia, South Asia, so forth. So. Right. And you know, was, I think it's because probably I grew up on like friends or fight club or something. Um, <laughs> I, I always told like my parents growing up, you know, um, I don't want to work an office job like you all or something like that. And then, you know, my father always told me, what is the you prioritize our passion, right? And he said, passion is the greatest way to become bankrupt. Oh, that's um, a good line. So it's a good line. He's just, has no idea why I prioritize passion and authenticity so much. It's just there's a disconnect for him there. Yeah, so totally different yeah. way of thinking. Man, that's right. Gray, thank you so much, brother. We could keep talking for much longer. Uh, such a rich conversation. Thanks for taking the time that you have out of your busy schedule to uh, to bless us and give us your thoughts and and um, and just yeah, helping us understand belief, biblical belief. Uh, all the, the ways in which we're influenced that we may not realize. And uh, yeah, for sharing your wisdom with us. We appreciate you. And next time we'll bring you down so we can show you around the South. That's right. Yeah, show yeah, you. I'm looking so, forward to it. Show you, <laughs> so you, uh, give you some good Southern cooking and, and uh, all that comes with that. So uh, grateful for you, man. Blessings to you. Thanks for what you do. Man, I love that conversation. And, yeah. and sometimes it's so helpful even if you've been a follower of Christ for years, decades, to be reminded of the of those fundamental uh, tenets of the faith, what does it when we say we believe? What does it mean, and what are the implications that come with that? And even the context that he was helping us, you know, remember and or maybe know for the first time in terms of belief in different parts of the world and how we all believe the same thing if we're Christians, but how that plays out socially and the cultural implications and mm -hmm. all that, that we kind of wrap around our faith that we don't realize we wrap around it. 
uh, is it's just really helpful yeah, to have those those thoughts and conversations. Yeah, I think they've been great. I think it's um, these past two have been a little heavier than yeah, normal, yeah. Um, but setting us up for where we're headed. Yeah. I think um, hearing from Michael in the first episode about uh, the truth of where the church is now, this great dechurching, as well as um, having a greater understanding of what belief is uh, from Gray today. And then our next one, uh, Courtney Doctor, will be ta- who, who is our um, this year's women's ministry retreat speaker. Yeah. Excited about her. She's done a ton with Gospel Coalition. And she's going to talk about what Jesus himself said about belief through those seven I am statements. And then after that, we get to hear three more uh, fantastic episodes about, so what do we do with all this? Yeah. Like, what does belief look like in our own lives? How do we live missionally? And one that I'm especially excited about is we have a couple that are talking about, uh, what about for our children? Mm. How can we really invest in our kids, um, these beliefs that we hold, that they might too embrace them? Yeah, yeah. This is going to be good. I hope you'll stay with us on this journey as we uh, consider belief and all that's wrapped up in that as it pertains to following Christ. So hope it's been a blessing to you so far, and we think it will be in uh, the episodes to come.